to mute uh, if you haven't already done so, so that we don't get any extraneous noise. Great. Thank you. Dear well, Croeso Cynesir Ail mewn cyfres o bedwar cyflwyniad ar fywyd gwaith a dylanwad y meddig teulu eithriadol Dr. Julian Tudor Hart. Um, this is the second, it would have been the fourth, but it's the second of four um, talks about the life and the work and the legacy of that remarkable doctor, uh, Dr. Julian Tudor Hart. And uh, we're very, very pleased uh, that everybody's been able to join us, and in particular, the two uh, distinguished speakers, uh, Jonathan Richards and Gareth Jones. And I'll just say a tiny bit about uh, each of them to introduce them. Jonathan um, has been a, a general practitioner serving the people of Merthyr Tidville for the whole of his career. He's, he's retired now. He was also, on top of that, a quality and improvement lead for 30 years and a clinical director at Cum Tarv Health Board uh, for six years. He's been an external professor at the University of South Wales since 1997, and he still supports the Welsh Institute of Health and Social Care. Gareth uh, has been a journalist uh, for uh, almost 40 years. He began with uh, ITV in Wales and then uh, moved to the BBC in London, uh, working all over the years for about 10 years. He also did a, bit, a brief stint for the World Health Organization in Geneva. Since 2000, he's been back in Wales, uh, reporting and producing and directing current affairs documentaries on all kinds of uh, subjects, uh, ranging from uh, health uh, to wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so welcome to uh, both of you, Kroiso Maur. Uh, there will be time for questions uh, afterwards. And if you'd like to flag up your questions um, as we go along, please do use the, the chat facility. Uh, I think that's everything by way of uh, introduction, except uh, just to apologise for the fact that our president, Carmen Thomas, uh, couldn't be with us today. She would have introduced uh, this, but she's not able to come. So uh, if you'll excuse me, I'm now going to hand over uh, to Gareth, uh, who is going to um, proceed with the rest of the hour. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you, Andrew. And um... Thank you for asking me to do this. Um, I'm delighted to uh, be able to um, mark the memory of uh, Julian Tudor Hart and to celebrate his legacy, which is what we're gonna try and do today. Um, and I made a few films uh, for Week In, Week Out um, back in, or about five, between five and six years ago. Uh, and I got to meet Julian and um, we interviewed him for our programs. And I brought together um, Jonathan Richards in those films because I, um, I knew that he would have been a, a protege of, um, of Julian and was also heavily involved in, in the same kind of work for many, many years. So he was a natural person, I thought, to, to make a film about. And so when Andrew asked me who I could think, could I think of anybody to, to, for this talk, the first person I thought of was was Jonathan and what fun it would be how nice it would be for, if I could um, if I could do the the questions and uh, so that's what we're going to do I'm going to introduce or Jonathan's going to introduce himself in a second just to say that um, we're then going to show a little film that Jonathan and I have edited um, down it's about 12 minutes long and it's a um, it's a 1986 film um, called The Pioneers um, so we'll show you that after a few uh, moments, and then we'll we'll talk about the film and more about Jonathan's um, John what J Jonathan's view of of uh, Julian's legacy, and then we'll have some questions. So Jonathan, perhaps you could uh, tell everybody what you've been doing really um, for the last um, years and how you got to meet Julian. Well, thanks. And, and again, thank you for this opportunity to reflect on um, the fact that I met Julian when I was still a teenager and immediately he had a dramatic impact on my life. And at the time, I didn't know what my life was going to be. I had no idea that I would be working in Merthyr, working in the NHS in Wales. 
But because of his passion, when he spoke to a conference that I helped to organize in Cardiff when I was a medical student, um, and his clarity of thought and his inspiration, and some of the things we're going to be talking about today, you know, his, how for him, science was an absolute priority. You know, we, we had to be scientific in everything we did. At the same time, his commitment to people. Um, I, I was born a socialist. Um, so immediately, if you like, Julian and I uh, shared a lot from that point of view in terms of our core values, the people we were, the people we aspired to be and so on. And at the time, I, the, the people running this, this uh, group in Cardiff, um, one of them had actually worked in Glen Corrug as some work experience. And so she was talking about what we're going to be hearing about in the film, um, his, what went into his freezer. And she spoke about him, and it was really quite romantic to hear what she was saying. So Julian had a profound impact on my life, you know, as possibly only one or two other people have had. And um, we worked together, we strived together. Um, I'm reminded of a couple of things I didn't discuss with Gareth in preparation. For example, um, what in my early days as a visiting professor down at the university in Glintarv, um, Julian was invited. He was actually made a visiting professor as well. And he was invited when Nigel Stott was still the professor of general practice in Cardiff to, to experiment in the Cullen Valley. And in those days, the Cullen Valley was part of the Rotaf Health Board. And the idea was we were going to completely change primary care in the Cullen Valley according to Julian's principles and ideas. And it was a project called Going for Gold. And we put quite a lot of work into it. And thinking about legacy, you know, if you look at Welsh government policy today, some of that, actually, if, if you like, the grandparents of today's Welsh government policy for health and primary care clusters, for example, team working, for example, uh, shared decision making involving the community. We were working on that in the late 90s, early 2000s in the Going for Gold project. So Julian's, Julian's legacy, Julian's heritage is absolutely massive, even if perhaps not as visible as I'd like it to be. We'll, we'll come on to more of that. But personally, Jonathan, I mean, you, you, you know, you rose, you became professor of general practice and you became clinical director in a big health board. But before all of that, you chose to go to Merthyr to be a GP, um, very sort of low income uh, area. Was that inspired? It sounds just like what Julian did. Was it inspired by what he did? Well, it, it, I mean, the short answer is I came to Merthyr initially because I needed to do GP training and the Merthyr scheme um, was the first one to offer. But somebody said I would have a wonderful time. One of my year group told me who'd been working in Merthyr as a, as a junior doctor said I'd have a wonderful time here. My wife and I moved up here 40 years ago. We just like Julian and Mary loved the people of, of their community. We loved the people of our community. Had, you know, I've had a wonderful, we've had a wonderful life. We've had a wonderful family life here. And I did feel, you know, forgive me if this sounds hubristic, but I did feel, well, Julian has tried this in a small little village. I'm gonna see what I can do with his, his values, his principles, his approach to the science, his, his ideas in a bigger community with a larger practice. So yes, you know, and then particularly becoming a clinical director, I was able to try again some many years after going for gold, I was the clinical director of the Cullen Valley. And so we did try to implement some of Julian's principles, you know, the fundamental underlying values and principles in how things developed in the Cullen Valley between 2010 and 2016. Good, right. Okay. So let me sh uh, share my screen and we'll have a look at this video. I hope. Let me see. Okay, a few seconds of black to start with, but I assure you it will kick into action. Here we go. For 30 years, the residents of this tiny Welsh village helped their doctor in a series of extraordinary experiments. Together, they revolutionized the way our GPs look after our health. 
you can do a lot in the corridors of power if you are pro if you're going to go on doing the same thing that everybody else does but if you want to do something different you've got no allies at all so to get the world changed you've got to work at the bottom and there was no doubt at all the general practice was the bottom Julian Tudor Hart was born in 1927 to a middle-class London family his father and mother were both doctors and both socialists we were very privileged compared to most people the main way I perceived it was of being frightened of poor children I think most well-off children are aware of that they, they know that they are growing up in a very unjust world which is unsafe for them they feel insecure I, I certainly did I thought of being a doctor as a way for privileged educated people to re-enter the human race and uh, have a useful social function. He was a 21-year-old medical student in 1948, coming of age with the National Health Service. His politics and his passions exactly coincided with the ideals of the time. This film will show you that we're winning our battles. They're battles we've been fighting for a long time against poverty, disease and ignorance. You'd got the mass of the population absolutely determined that they weren't going to go back to the kind of society that we had before the war, with a handful of very, very rich people getting richer and richer, and an enormous number of very poor people excluded from society. 40 million men, women, and children whose birthright is health. It was marvellous that we made this really generous decision as a nation that from now on medical care is not going to be a commodity it's not going to be something that's bought and sold on the market uh, it's going to be something that is available free according to need uh, not according to ability to pay he qualified as a doctor in 1952 and started work the following year in the slums of West London the older people had terrible lives with an incredible amount of illness and premature death and chronic suffering. The backlog of illness included leg ulcers, gynecological problems, heart disease and pneumonia. The workload was overwhelming. And in 1958, Julian appealed for more resources in a BBC report on the first decade of the NHS. I think we're having a very good service, but where we need to spend a great deal more money is an attention to patients in their own homes, in doctor's surgeries, in fact, outside hospital. I'm sure the real answer is for us to have very many fewer patients, say about 2,500, and put far more work into each one of them. If we were able to do that, then it would be up to us to improve our standard of work. In 1961, Julian Tudor Hart decided to look for a small community where he could really have an effect on the health of his patients. Glencorig, an impoverished Welsh village with 2,000 people fitted the bill exactly. Over the next 15 years, Julian's research activities attracted huge numbers of visitors to the Tudor Hart home, among them the young Graham Watt. A lot of people beat the path to the door of a famous man. I went there with some trepidation. Here was this famous GP. Uh, I knew he was a Marxist, I knew that I wasn't a Marxist, uh, and I, I wondered whether I would pass the test. Mary and Julian Hart must be the most hospitable people that there are in terms of the number of people that they've put up and put up with over the years, uh, students and visiting doctors. And we sometimes refer to the unofficial University of Glencorig as the people who've been and uh, worked there. We have had one reunion. There are three professors, uh, so far, and there may be one or two more. And I, I think we're all fired with the same uh, vision that Julian's got. Well, he was going away lecturing, and he wrote articles, and the newspapers started to get hold of it, the BBC was ringing up, all that sort of thing. But um, he, he didn't, it didn't make any difference to his behaviour. He was just, as usual, and we'd also get um, telephone calls from abroad. Mm. We're in a small community. It was very rare to get um, a call from Spain or um, America. 
This is a man who I know at first hand was offered um, chairs in great medical schools in this country and turned them down because he did not want to leave his practice. Julian's research was rooted in his practice. Preventing heart disease, which kills half the British population, was always a priority. And as well as his studies on blood pressure, he also researched diet. In 1982, a group of patients was asked to cut out salt for eight weeks. It was a bit of a shock, you know. You couldn't have the bottle of sauce on the table anymore. Or you couldn't have anything, uh, convenience foods of any kind. Everybody's reducing their salt intake, but some people is having it, are having it brought back up with the tablets and others aren't, and nobody knows who is on what salt intake. Financially, there was no way you could replace, for example, beef burger with a, a piece of plain meat. And we couldn't inflict those financial burdens on the people of Glencora. But what used to tickle me about the surgery was at one time when you went there, the smell of cooking. Yeah. No, you wouldn't get that in other surgeries. We'd make our biscuits and scones and and meat pies and... Shepherd's pies and curries and cakes. Well, we had a freezer full. Uh, it was like a shop in, 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 our mini, in our research unit. When they came each week to have their blood pressure taken, then they actually went away, away with a carrier bag full of things, including fresh fruit. We had to make wall charts and recipe books, and we generally tried to put ourselves in the places of... Of, of the of the participants. Well, the only way to find out how much salt people are eating is actually to find out how much salt they, they excrete. That the only way you could do it reliably was to collect seven 24-hour urines in a row. That means that you can't flush the toilet for a week, it's all got to go into a bottle. So we were like milkmen in reverse, in that we delivered empty containers and picked up the full containers. Some of them were scaffolders in, in the steelworks and they would take off these large uh, containers that c contained four litres. Some of them were miners, so they actually had to take their um, pot down the pit with them. The teenagers uh, would have to go to school with these containers. There was one occasion when somebody actually n knocked Dr Hart's door at 11 o'clock in the night, desperate because he couldn't get home and he didn't want to lose anything, so Mary had to provide him with a pot there and there. <laughs> They had hoped to prove that high blood pressure could be reduced by diet, but in fact they found that in so short a period, there was no effect. From his Welsh Valley practice, Julian Tudor Hart's ideas have permeated far beyond the confines of Glencorig, to the citadels of the teaching hospitals and the medical establishment, where he's been a name to reckon with for the past four decades. Uh, so it's got to be on a new basis, but we don't need to be... A Yes. You don't need to be a business, and it isn't working as a business. No, I, I agree. Yeah, I agree, yeah, but I, think I, I, I still think that's the issue. But I'm just concerned that one can't simply say the money will take care of itself. I'm not sure that I would have been really seen as a dependable uh, person at the top table, uh, which I'm not uh, dis not quarrelling with. Uh, uh, I think my role was to be a thorn in the flesh of the establishment. He retired from general practice in 1987 and from research five years later. He still writes prolifically and lectures all over the world. He's currently helping design a healthcare system in Kazakhstan. At home, he opposes the introduction of internal markets in the National Health Service, believing they undermine its original vision. I think our big case against the internal market and competition is that cooperation works better than competition. We were on the high road to much better quality care through cooperation. We didn't need marketization. We didn't need to be made to compete with each other. And the whole idea that we lacked motivation, that we can only be motivated by seeing uh, carrots or pound shillings and pence uh, on the end of a line, it, it's just, it, it's so insulting. He has a very, very strong sense of justice. And I think he sees medicine as an instrument for making life fairer for people. Um, and that when medicine departs from that, for Julian, it's betrayal. You don't mind, Jill. 
Julian has committed his life to providing excellent, innovative health care in an area of great social need. He wanted to improve the health of his population by collaborating with his patients over time, and he succeeded. The evidence is that it has paid off. It's very difficult to get really convincing statistics from such a small population, even over such a long period of time. We, we did a study uh, over 25 years uh, with a lot of measurements in it. Uh, it certainly showed that compared with a comparable population in a neighbouring village uh, where the style of medical care was rather different from ours, more, more traditional, uh, there was a, a substantial difference in average age of death. Compared with the general population of the South Wales Valleys, Julian Tudor Hart's patients now live significantly longer, healthier lives. Many people sentimentalise us, and I resent that. What we've done was hard work. It was our bread and butter. Many people like to think of Julian's work as a researcher, but really we were providing straightforward family medicine to a, a, a village that we were paid to do. If you're going to spend your life in one place, you've got to choose it carefully. You go where nobody else wants to go because that way you've got some scope for innovation. I wouldn't give a thank you for being banished to uh, affluent Berkshire or something like that. It isn't where we wanted to live. You can't do anything there. Nope, oh, there we are. Can you see me? Am I back with you? Good. Um, well, I enjoyed that. Um, although, I'm, how many of you noticed that the presenter couldn't actually pronounce Glyn Korug? <laughs> I don't think you would have that today. Uh, but apart from that, I, I thought it was a very interesting insight. You, 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 Jonathan, you really got um, a little insight into the, the character of the man and his values, didn't you? Oh, absolutely. Oh. And I think, you know, it was very emotional to look back. Um, but I think, you know, in terms of celebrating Julian, it's really quite shocking to think that that interview, um, going back to the, the, the 1950s, some of the points he made there are still true in 2022. And the, the way in which the health service has changed over the years, you know, there are some key things that have still not changed. And I, you know, I must be disciplined and careful not to go on a rant. But, you know, I'm, I'm so disappointed that his wonderful description of general practice as being um, a, like a corner shop business where the general practitioners live off the profits of the business. Sadly, that is still very much true today. And because you know, we used to have debates in my practice and, um, and I, I worked with some fantastic um, colleagues um, up to eight at one point and then down to five and then up to 12. And a number of them were also inspired by Julian, but not all of them. And so one, one person said, well, I, I, I want to take more money out of the practice this year because I want to celebrate my wedding anniversary with, with a, a, a dream holiday. Somebody else said to me as he shook my hand when he left the practice, he said, Jonathan, I always wanted to own a BMW. Because one of my little aphorisms was, you can tell how much the GP is prepared to commit to his patients by the cars in the car park. We don't have BMWs and Mercedes Benz in our car park. So, so I, I, my heart broke for him because, you know, if he'd have wanted a BMW, he could have asked, you know, he could have, we, I'm sure we could have changed, you know, the profit that we lived from. Um, under the under this this track the model of the NHS that we still live with and if you look at the the BMA contracts for general practitioners in Wales today a lot of it is based on maximizing the profit of the practitioners and you know that that still breaks my heart so there's still work to be done for those of you with a political bent because his view wasn't it that GPs should be salaried they should be contracted to the NHS uh, and get a salary, and that their emphasis should be on um, prevention, prudent health care, getting into the community, getting out, doing house calls, talking to people, just spending a long time listening to people's stories, even before they'd come into the, 
the practice, getting out there. These are all deep fundamental aspects of his view, and we are still a long way. In fact, we seem to be perhaps going in a different direction. I think we're very much so. And of course, you know, speaking at the moment with COVID and all of its uncertainties, you know, Julian and I had a blazing row up in London at the Royal College of General Practitioners at a day conference on prevention and well-being. Um, because I, there's a sense in which I felt we needed to allow our patients to say no to our, our scientific and well-meaning advice, whereas he felt very much, you know, we do have our expertise, which, is, which is, is, you know, is based on a very strong rock, which is the randomized control trial. So if we know that a, a change in lifestyle or a change in behavior is going to benefit Mr. Williams, we really ought to be doing all we could to help Mr. Williams um, accept our ideas. Whereas I felt that it, the balance was slightly different for me personally, I had to give my permission, patients permission to say no. And in response to that, he told an anecdote you know, exactly like this, that, that there'd been a funeral in Glencorog only a few weeks earlier of somebody who died of a smoking related disease. And he went to the wake and he said to the patient, you smoke, do you want an early death? You smoke, do you want an early death? Now I tried that in our local fish and chip shop. I used to go when we had a branch surgery on the Gurness estate. I went into the local fish and chip shop and, and at the time uh, it was full of of youngsters from the local um, comprehensive school, you know, with their, their great big trays of chips. And, um, and I said to them, you know, there's just been a report saying the average age of death for men on the Gurness is mid fifties. Are you, can you do anything today so that you are also not part of that statistic when you are in your mid fifties? Now I'd had a dialogue with the fish shop owner and he'd agreed to cook the chips and the fish in a healthier fat with complaints from his customers because they preferred their chips cooked in lard. So it was a, a small public health gain. And the people looked at me as if I'd completely lost my head. You know, who is this mad bloke coming in and berating us for having our, our chips for lunch? Yeah. You, and you wouldn't get that today. You know, uh, I was talking to somebody only the other day and, and uh, well, I like Claire Girarda's um, essay in The Guardian this week about her career about how she, on her last day on call in December this last year, she didn't know a single person that she visited and how different that was from, uh, you know, when, when she started her career 30 years ago. Yes, I read that and that that's, was startling to me. H how on earth can we um, deliver or can GPs deliver healthcare if they don't know their patients? That was fundamental to, to Julian's way of thinking, wasn't it? Well, it was. I, mean, I I feel there's still more we can do, and I do feel that the with the NHS in Wales, um, particularly after the changes that Mark Drakeford introduced when he was our Minister for Health and Social Care, uh, there are there are opportunities that we can grasp about having teams and teams of of you know one of the things that struck me was that that for all of my career none of the doctors in my practice came from Merthyr. I'm pleased to say now a couple of the doctors in my practice are Merthyr young people um, who went away and then came back. But all of the receptionists are Mirtha people, all of the nurses are Mirtha people, all of the healthcare assistants are Mirtha people. So they know the community far better than I ever could. They know some of the, the nuances and the, the sensitivities, for example, between different communities and, and within families and so on. So I think there is, there's more that we could do if we made the most of the opportunities given to us by having teams and recognizing that there is a role for the doctor, if you like, as being a scientist who can assimilate evidence, evaluate evidence, and share complex decisions with, with, uh, with people where perhaps, for example, nurses or healthcare assistants may not want to do that. Now, again, I don't want to tread on anyone's toes, but you know, since 1997, I've been a visiting professor as a medical clinician in a school that trains nurses and midwives down at the university. So you know, I've got plenty of experience of the sensitivities of, well, this is what doctors do, and this is what doctors do best, and this is what doctors ought to do, and this is what nurses do, and this is what nurses do best. And so, for example, looking at one of the schemes we worked in in Kuntav, uh, we, we, worked in, we were funded by Welsh Government as a, as a pilot to look at addressing inequalities in health, and we employed and trained up healthcare assistants. 
um, to work with people on their risk of dying of heart disease. And the one who worked in my own practice was outstanding. He really knew Merthyr people. So when somebody came in and had a consultation about their risk of having a heart attack in the future, he could then communicate with them much more effectively than I ever would be able to, probably. And then that released me to do the stuff that as a doctor, I, you know, I was best fitted to do. So I think this is where we need creative thinking. We need to talk with people in the public and say, look, you may not see the doctor, but then the doctor may not be the best person for you to meet your, and again, going back to Julian's idea, it's about serving the population. You know, how do we serve the population most effectively um, with the greatest amount of care, with the best quality of relationship, rather than, well, how can the GPs earn enough to have to send their kids to private school? Hmm. I'm just looking at the figures and um, a few years ago, there was a lot of talk, wasn't there, about um, practices closing down, partnerships finishing because of the economics and practices were therefore getting bigger, absorbing each other. And there was also talk about this move where practices would have to be taken over by the local health board and run as with salaried uh, GPs, which is exactly how Julian would have wanted it. But I'm just looking at those figures and the number of GPs in, in, uh, in Wales has stabilized somewhere around 2000, is that right? Or, or, or is that GP practices? But anyway, whatever, that's a stable number. They don't seem to be going down. And also then there was no information about the number of salaried um, GPs I, I, that I could find. Have you got any idea whether change is coming about because of the economics or whether it's stalled? And then there's COVID as well to complicate it all. Well, I think we do face a particular challenge in Wales about geography, of course, you know, that there are fewer doctors willing to work, live and work in West Wales and in North Wales um, and in the South Wales Valleys. I, you know, towards the end of my working life in Merthyr, I was, my heart broke when we had a salary doctor who said, well, I'm never going to move from Cowbridge and I'm going to look for an easier job nearer to Cowbridge where I live. You know, and the last conversation I had with Julian, thanks to you, you know, you drove me down to, to, their, to their home. Um, we had a long conversation about medical education and Julian's passion for inspiring and influencing the next generation of doctors. And I know there have been lots of changes in the curriculum in Wales, um, but sadly, they don't seem to have worked through in terms of producing, a, you know, I mean, Julian, one of his best books was a new kind of doctor. You know, the current medical school curriculum is not producing, if you like, a new kind of doctor inspired by Julian's ideals and Julian's principles. But there is, but there's still a great deal of work to be done. Yeah. Um, in the film, we, we saw Graham Watt, didn't we? Um, yeah. And he, of course, went on uh, another protege of Julian. He went on back up to Glasgow, where he brought about the Deep End project. Um, can you tell us, because you've kept, you've kept across those developments, haven't you? Can you tell us? what that is exactly? Well, the starting point for me was that uh, one of my research interests and one of my speaking interests was inequalities in health, poverty, deprivation, and the impact on health and well-being. And I always had to be very careful to say, Merthyr Tydfil is the most unhealthy place in England and Wales, because there were many communities in uh, uh, Scotland, particularly the, the industrial belt, if you like, uh, north of Glasgow and between Glasgow and Edinburgh, but where the, the data were substantially uh, worse um, in that sense than they were in Merthyr. And then, then Merthyr is now more healthy than other parts of South Wales, like Blind and Gwent. And I don't want to get into an arm wrestle with anybody who wants to say, no, no, I live in the most unhealthy place in, in <laughs> Wales, for example, because sadly that did used to happen. Um, so Graham Watt you know, went to Glasgow. He was a professor there. He did some brilliant research, but he was supported by a network you know, the, of the universities in, in Scotland work together much more collaboratively than we did in Wales. Uh, the Scottish Health Department and now Scottish Government had a different attitude towards health and well-being compared to the Welsh Government. 
the Royal College of GPs in Scotland was substantially stronger than the Royal College of GPs in Wales. And so the university in Glasgow, the government, uh, the Scottish government and the Royal College of GPs got together and they asked uh, the, the, the general practitioners, the nurses and the people of, of the, the most deprived, I can't remember the proportion now, but it might have been the most deprived 50 practices in Scotland. What do you need to, to, to survive? What do you need to provide better quality of care? And following a period of consultation, they came up with, an, with, with a manifesto for change, a manifesto for improvement, and they called it the Deep End Project based on Julian's principle of the inverse care law, uh, which is 50 years old uh, last week, uh, this month, I think, or possibly last month, um, when he published a paper in The Lancet, uh, effectively saying that where the need for healthcare is greatest, the availability of that healthcare is, is the least. Now, there are different ways of interpreting that, and anybody who's interested in that, I encourage you to go to the Health Foundation website, where there's been a very recent publication about um, a review of efforts in England since 20, 000, to, to the year 2000 to address inequalities in health. And it keeps on going back to Julian's uh, paper um, from 1972. Uh, so they came up with this agenda to say, well, how can we take people out of the deep end and not just the people, but the practices serving them? And then how can we help them into the shallow end? And how can we make the whole pool shallower and fairer if you look at all the statistics about deprivation in health? So they were funded and they've been able to show, they've been going about 15 years now, they, they were able to show that with funding and support, with the right kind of strategies, uh, you could actually address the kind of challenges faced by um, the, the, the most deprived communities, the most neglected communities, communities where problems were just, you know, if you, if you looked at them, they were beyond comprehension. I mean, if I can be honest amongst a group of chums here, I used to go to Glasgow for conferences and I would I would feel quite guilty about how relieved I felt that, for example, in South Wales, we didn't have the, the level and severity of intravenous drug use and then consequent HIV and hepatitis B and so on that my my friends and colleagues in the in the practices are in and around Glasgow were having to face. We didn't face some of the housing problems that they were still tackling in in, a, in that part of Scotland that we had been able to address, in, certainly in the South Wales Valleys, you know, since the 1970s and 1980s. So they've, they've done a great deal of work. When I was a clinical director, uh, you know, what, uh, in, in, the, in the early 2000s, we wanted to get a deep end project in Wales. But I'm sorry to say one or two people in Welsh government were not interested. The Royal College of GPs had another agenda. We had no support from the British Medical Association. Uh, the Cardiff University had a very different sort of agenda. It didn't happen. I don't know if anybody on the call today is aware, you know, that they're, if you like, now, you know, let's say 10 years on from when I was trying to get the deep end going in Wales, there's another effort and more people are now on board. And now I think Cardiff University is more on board than it was then. I think Welsh government sees it as a way of, of sharing good practice. But, but it, you know, it, that probably wouldn't have happened without Julian's thinking, the experiences that Julian gave to um, Graham Watt and all the people working on the Deep End Project in Scotland. And if I may, can I also talk about, if you hear about improvements in East London, like the Tower Hamlets project, um, a lot of good things have happened in Tower Hamlets and the regions around Tower Hamlets in East London. And the people behind that, I know at least two of them were also people who went to Glyn Corrib and were inspired by Julian and then went back to London, um, including our former chief medical officer, Tony Jewell. And for me, if I was, you know, if you said, well, you know, let's not look to Scotland, you know, what can we learn from England? You know, an example for, for, for Wales of how to do things properly is the way things have been done for the last 15 years in Tower Hamlets. So I, I was quite moved when I suddenly realized that I'd not had this conversation with you, Gareth, that that, you know, particularly if people want to look it up on the internet, you know, look up Tower Hamlets, look up John Robson, for example, um, who is, he's probably retired now, but we, John Robson used to be brought down by Welsh government to inspire us when I was a clinical director to say, look, this is what we've done and this is how we've done it. 
And some of this isn't rocket science, is it? Because I was looking at um, Graham Watt um, on YouTube before this, and um, he was explaining that what they've managed to do is get enough resources and, uh, and restructure general practices to enable the GP to have, I think, a day, was it, or a session, whatever that is, a whole day of the free for that person to do what they thought was important for the health of their local community, not what they were being told to do by algorithms and, and by their local health board or anybody else, clinical autonomy briefly for that period. And that's what it, he was about, wasn't it, Julian? Well, very much so. And I suppose, you know, reflecting on his legacy, one of the challenges is, of course, is, is you know, and I don't have an answer for this, but do you get more innovation, more improvement, if you have people who are salaried and perhaps you know that whatever they do they'll get their money or or do you get a bet if you if you adopt a market model and an entrepreneurial model will you get more innovation and i'm struck again i suppose by values and principles you know, that that in scotland you know if, when i visited glasgow it was just so inspiring to meet so many like-minded people mm. now, sadly in my own working life I, I in 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 Kumtav and, and the old Mid Glamorgan, I was viewed as something of a maverick, so, you know, rather like Julian said in his interview, you know, somebody who was came from left field, somebody who wasn't welcome at the top table because he was too chopsy or he was too much of a troublemaker. Yeah, um, you know, it was fantastic for me to have two or three colleagues in my own practice who shared my values and shared my principles. But if I was going to say what does the future hold in Wales? You know, I would want to say as strongly as I could, we need to think about how can we inculcate people with Julian's values, Julian's principles, to then follow his example. And, and then, you know, deep end projects, the Tower Hamlets project, they show that things can be done. If you think about how you're going to do it in a scientific way, in a compassionate way, in a service orientated, public orientated, co-productive way. Mm. Um, has anybody got any questions for Jonathan? Um, yes. Please say who you are as well. And, and off you get. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for the presentation, actually, and for Andrew for arranging this series of talks. Um, Dr. Hart was my GP until he retired. Um, I, I do remember being taken as a, I think, uh, about eight or nine, my mother said, come on, we've got to go down and sign on with the new doctor and being taken to him in the back kitchen of what was one of the council houses to go through all the formalities. And um, in that Pioneers film, <clears throat> I, he refers to one person that he couldn't get a sample from because they were at sea. That was me, I think, <laughs> because I worked in uh, marine research oceanography. And I was on one of the Royal Research Ships in the Mid-Atlantic at the time. Um, but <clears throat> I, I, my question is really, how, how extensive um, does, his, um, does his research reflect in the structure of the NHS in Wales at the moment? Because I do remember going, a few years ago, I went to his funeral and it was like a who's who of Welsh government there in, in Margham Crematorium. Um, I, I, I sort of think he's one of the very much unsung heroes of Wales. And um, there ought to be, his name ought to be a lot wider known. You're absolutely right. Uh, and, and I was I was at the funeral, and as you say, you know, the great and the good, and not just from Wales, the great and the good from all over yeah. the UK. If not, you know, I think people did visit from abroad as well. And if you if 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 you were trying to identify his his legacy, and I suppose again, for some reason in my brain today, I'm thinking about family histories and genetics, you can see embedded in a lot of things that are happening in Welsh government policy, in Welsh government documentation. The Welsh government priorities, his principles, his values. I mean, one the one of the ones for me in, in a book, you know, I wish he hadn't called it feasible socialism because 
the, the, you know, he called it feasible socialism because he was passionate about it. The ideas in feasible socialism were brilliant, but could I get my GP colleagues to read it? I really couldn't. Mm. But one of the key things from there was about how the, the you know, and let's widen the professional uh, example, you know, the doctor or the nurse or the healthcare assistant or the physio or the community pharmacist and the person together co-produce improved health because he part of what was behind feasible socialism was to say how can we you know we don't have mines anymore we don't have washing machine factories anymore we don't have steelworks how can we say the people of wales produce things so this is this was what was behind going for gold mm, you know, we can yeah. say pe the people of wales can work together to produce improved health better outcomes stronger communities and all that kind of thing and co-production is a core component of everything that Welsh government is and Welsh government does. Um, mm. So that would be one example. I think his insistence on science, and again, think about his work on hypertension. You know, probably people today don't realise that a whole range of things about the way in which uh, people living with high blood pressure, you know, the way in which they're assessed, the way in which they're managed, the way in which they're supported to live with their condition, all of that can find a root a family tree ancestry in um, Julian's pioneering work on hypertension. He was um, a very frequent visitor to our house because we had a very elderly grandmother and my father who had dust and was on oxygen cylinders every day. Uh, <clears throat> but at the grassroots level, there were things like um, when my father first started having oxygen, um, my mother had to pay for it is when prescription charges came in. And I do remember him in the back room of our house saying, are you paying for these, um, these, these cylinders, Mrs. Colvin? And my mother said, yes. And he said, hmm. And I don't know what happened, but she never paid again. So it's very much at that sort of basic level. And he knew everybody. He knew all the generations. So he knew that you were likely to get something in the family because your auntie so-and-so up the road had it as well. Absolutely. I mean, that was one of my personal sadnesses was, was, was finding that the younger doctors, because they didn't do so many home visits, they, you know, it was a different style of being a, G a GP by the time I retired. I, somebody might come in and I'd say they'd be talking about this teenager and I'd say, well, of course, her grandmother was just the same at that age. And they'd look at me and think, what do you mean? And I'd say, well, you know, the, the, you know conditions, tendencies, uh, likelihoods of getting conditions do run in families mm. and it, when you know the family and mm. uh, you can then make those links particularly for me it was making the links between daughters and realizing that you know we 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 you know that there might be four sisters but they'd all have different surnames in those days but then when you realized who they were and you knew who their mum and dad were you you suddenly had a completely different perspective well that's why this family is consulting about this problem or that's why mm. they they, they, you know, that's why they do have this other problem and so on. I remember his father as well. He was quite a character. But I just sort of blessed the day that um, my mother took me to sign on with this new doctor. Mm. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Colvin. Gareth, um, I think that Jill Burgess has a question on the chat. All right. Let me read that out. Um, it's funny. I can't, I can't see that, Andrew. I haven't got it on mine. Oh, well, I've, I've got it on mine. I mean, the simple answer is very much so. And I think, again, it's about... What's the question? Balance. Jonathan, could you sorry, read the question? I'm sorry, the please. question is, uh, yesterday I watched a webinar on cardiovascular disease prevention. Do you see the benefit of hubs in Wales to do more interventions? And I think that, that you know, the word hub, unfortunately, can mean all sorts of different things. And when you're an NHS manager, you might choose to use that word to say, look, we're doing a developing a hub when actually it isn't a hub. Um, you're just keeping the civil servants or the politicians happy. But if we think about how can we meet the needs of the people as close to where they live as possible, then a hub is a brilliant idea. I mean, my own worked experience in Merthyr was we, we were funded by Welsh Government to have a community service volunteer for a year to, to help us understand the people of Dowlas better. Well, Dowlas is only two miles and one bus journey from the centre of Merthyr. But this young, uh, brilliant young lady, she found in a year of talking to people that many Dowless people struggled to get to things just two miles away, where, they, where we had good bus services. 
and if you wanted to get to the leisure center for a, a referral on a, an exercise referral on prescription, as it used to be called, it was actually three buses you had to take to get there. Well, immediately there are barriers to that that somebody like myself would just never understand. So hubs are really important. And then if that hub is staffed by local people who've had the right kind of training, uh, it's fantastic. You know, I mean, all sorts of examples, you know, like healthcare assistants who can share knowledge of risk. You know, I, I noticed Welsh Government has launched a diabetes pre uh, prevention strategy, and that's going to rely on healthcare assistants in communities. You know, and if we can have a healthcare assistant working in, in if you like, the communities that, that, that in Merthyr, then people don't have to get one or two buses or a taxi to get the health advice they need, to get the support they need. So I think you know, if, if it can be designed well, it can work brilliantly and meet the needs of people. Yeah. Do, what are they exactly, um, Jonathan, these hubs? Well, you see, this is where I don't, you know, because I don't know, I don't, I don't actually know that I know anybody on the call. So I don't know whether I can just freely give rein to my opinion. But for example, hub has a technical meaning if you're in health and social care because it is part of a Welsh government strategy of a number of years now to bring together health and social care and the third sector into communities. Now, there are then questions about, well, why was that community chosen in Merthyr and not that community? Uh, what, that community in the Rhondda and not that community? And I was talking to somebody in the Merthyr hub a couple of years ago, and he said, well, whatever we do, we're never doing that activity in this hub. This hub's going to focus on that which it goes completely against Julian's idea of let's meet all the deep end idea of let's find out what the people's needs are and then let's use all our skills and resources in the hub to address them. Mm. You know, and I suppose it's inevitable in, an all, in, a, in a system like the NHS that Welsh government, the ministers tell the civil servants, implement this, we're going to put a budget behind it. The civil servants tell the health boards, implement this, there's a budget for it. And the health boards look at how they can best do it. And for me, that's one of the challenges in Wales, that some parts of Wales had fantastic cluster network development with fantastic hubs. Sadly, in other parts of Wales, it's not happening. Can I, can I intervene? Sorry, I'm the person who asked the question. Ah, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, the reason that I found it interesting is that it's a five-year study and it's an audit uh, for national primary care in England. And I just wondered, it looked like um, a very good prospect insofar as they were gathering together doctors, GP surgeries in order to have um, a more streamlined national primary care and thereby um, they were looking at the individual patient um, earlier in the interventions to do with cardiovascular um, and therefore they could already within the year of them starting it measure that they'd saved within this. Um, I understand the not liking the word hub, but it's a network of GPs that actually came together and provided in a central place access for patients in one place. Um, so it's sort of a, a centre of excellence. And I just thought, why haven't we got that in Wales? Sorry. Well, we've got similar things in Wales. You know, if you, if you look at um, the the innovations that have developed, you know, because we and our Bevan Health Board and ourselves, we were funded for three years to pilot different ways of doing this work. And then Aaron Bevan did it one way, we did it another way. And we've been able to show after three years that there were improvements in cardiovascular management. And we based our healthcare assistance in GP surgery. Uh, so, but, but in some parts of Wales, putting it in the GP surgery may not be the most convenient thing for the people. And you may want to use a community center or some other form of, of community hub to bring people together. and particularly because now with so much technology is mobile, you know, you don't need to go to the doctor because that's the only place there that you're going to have a blood pressure machine, a computer, a peak flow meter, all the other things you might want to do. You know, a lot of these things can be taken to the people. And they, actually that's what the NRM Bevan model was. They took things out to workplaces and, and where the people were. Yeah, but are you saying then that in the study that you did then yours was proven to be the most beneficial as Welsh government not taking any part of that initiative and put it out into well, they have Well, they have now. I mean, because I've retired from the health board some four years ago, I don't know how it has been developed and shared. Um, and I don't know whether anybody on this call would be able to share that. But 
things have been done, good practice has been shared. But again, the difficulty is, you know, and, and I'm going to tread on some toes here potentially, particularly if, if, if somebody, but you know, the BMA has not always been supportive of no, these know. kind of initiatives. I know, it's shocking. Absolutely so it, shocking. Well, it is shocking. And to, well, mm, sorry, I'm yeah, I'm, I'm with you. you use the word shameful. I'm with you on that, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, sorry. Yes. Uh, first of all, can I go back to Andrew's opening remarks and say personally to uh, the speakers how sorry I am that so few have joined the meeting today. An excellent uh, uh, talk and discussion has evolved and hopefully people will pick it up on YouTube. Having said that, I'm old enough to remember the introduction of the National Health Service and uh, there, I remember too how it was abused by uh, people within the community, saying, you know, these are freebies and were thinking they were going for a joyride and all manner of things. Having said that, my experience of the National Health Service, I know there are some shortfalls, but my experience and of many other people that they have been doing an excellent job overall that they have found the staff uh, at all levels courteous, pleasant, and dedicated and communicative uh, with the patients and uh, those associated with them. And for that, I think we have to be extremely grateful. Coming down though to um, the local scene, uh, I think it's been recognized during the talk that um, We've moved away really from that close contact between patient and doctor where things are being done online uh, and on telephone, uh, which I think is a, 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 a great drawback really because the, uh, the personal face-to-face uh, -face, uh, discussion is far more beneficial. And hopefully that, um, we, that this is not lost sight of um, having now uh, uh, been living with the pandemic, and that was the reason why this was introduced, that they will reassess the need to, to have much better contact face-to-face. Uh, -face. You do it if you're going to go into hospital, but not so much in the local surgery. And um, only on a, on a, 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 you've um, showed us things on television. I'm not using Dr. Martin for those who might have seen some of his act. Um, um, <laughs> programs but interestingly there's a doctor living in the community who's not necessarily in the surgery but walking down the road and speaking to people I think you can you come to the surgery I think you've got so and so uh, it's been an educational thing that kind of program um, I, I cannot see that happening within general practice but really that seemed to be a highlight the importance of the relationship between the doctor and the local community. Absolutely, and I mean, for me, it's been so rich, you know, and, and, I, and I've gained so much more from that than, than the occasional, some person shouting at me in Tesco's or whatever it might be. And, you know, my car's only been broken into twice in all my working life compared to some in places in other communities. But I think that, that you know, General practitioners are, particularly the Royal College of GPs, are very worried about what you've been talking about, about this, this kind of move into uh, transactional care, move into virtual care and so on. So a lot of thought and work is going into how can we re-establish, uh, you know, the jargon phrase is relational care, re-establish care based on relationships. And relationships really only happen face to face. You know, we are not having a good enough relationship in this meeting this afternoon because we're not able to share some of the subtleties that might be shared with body language and so on. It's a very different kind of experience. So I hope that somehow we'll find a way through um, the current enthusiasm. And of course, the reality is that still, I think it's 60% of all, all care in primary care is provided face to face. It's just that you don't hear about that and you don't see it. And of course, perhaps for those of us you know, who've tried to get hold of the GP, you know, if we have, a, you know, like if, I, if I need a medication review, well, that can be done online or over, over the video.
But if I wanted to talk about some worries in my family, I really would want to have a conversation with, with somebody face to face and hopefully somebody who would know me and know my family and so on. So it, you know, and there's, I think in Wales, there are some fantastic things, you know, cluster network development, which was something that Mark Drake had introduced and he funded, you know, it's, it's now what, six or seven years old, I think. And that in some parts of Wales, where you've had in innovators, you've had people with the right kind of values, it is showing real fruit. My sadness is there are other parts of Wales where that isn't happening. And you know, I don't know if we are coming, oh gosh, we're gone two o'clock already, but one of the inspirations for me goes right the way back to Nye Bevan. Now I, I'm bound to get the quotation wrong, but you know, <coughs> Nye Bevan, one of his famous sayings was, you know, I want the people of Tredegar to have the quality of care that the people get in Harley Street. And he introduced this idea of the universa, universality of the best. Now, interestingly, when Mark Drakeford was the minister, and we, he introduced the innovation called prudent healthcare, he actually said, we have to grapple with that because we can't afford the best, but we must go for the universality of the good enough. Now, you know, perhaps if that's a political debate to be had about how do we fund the NHS so that we could look to implement what an Aaron Bevan's passion was, universality of the very best. And that's what we wanted in Merthyr. We wanted our, our patients, our communities to have the very best possible care that we could deliver. Thank you, um, Jonathan. And thank you, Mr. Morris, for your question and observations. Uh, Andrew, I don't suppose I've got time to show that slide now. I was hoping to, have I? Uh, I think I can try and uh, sh uh, sh All right. show, it, uh, show it now. I, thought, I, I, I wanted to show people this because um, I did the last interview with Julian. The, three, four years ago, just months before he died. And I, I asked him about how he was shaped, uh, yeah, you did that. confronting death. Uh, he had a few months left to live. And this is what he said. I'll read it out for those who perhaps can't see it. It's ridiculous. It's, he turned down treatment, you see, for um, the cancer he had. Mm. He, he was only getting treatment for the symptoms, pain and so forth. It's ridiculous, I think, to go on indefinitely trying to save a life and the lowest possible priority should be given to extending a human life beyond 100 years or whatever. At some point, we may need to consider letting things take their natural course more often because we don't have another planet. And I think this is something that there might be more agreement from patients than we anticipate. I don't know many who want eternal life. I would dread it. But um, at least, you know, that's typical of the man. I think many people would say so sort of um, rational, um, but caring as well, in a sense, for the planet. Um, and it's a great legacy, I, I, I think. It's a nice thing to end on, I think, um, that, you know, we're celebrating his legacy today. And one quick mention as well is that we haven't mentioned Mary, his wife. She is always overlooked in these conversations. And yet, of course, she did so much in that practice to, to make real the, um, the aspirations of them both. The hard, a lot of the hard yards was down to Mary and, and she shirks the limelight, um, but there you are, I've said something for her <laughs> today. Thank you very much, uh, Gareth, uh, for that. That was, that was a really good end uh, to the session. Uh, I don't think Mary is with us today. Uh, she was last time, uh, but I'll make sure that she does see this. Uh, can I thank both of you? Um, we're really grateful uh, to both of you for a really stimulating hour. Um, you said, uh, Jonathan, right at the beginning, I think, that um, Julian Tudor Hart had had a profound impact on, on your life. And uh, we can see now how, how that's happened, and particularly as, as you've talked about the, the legacy and what's happened, uh, particularly in Wales, since, um, since Julian Hart's um, retirement. Um, it's been a very, very interesting way of approaching how medical services work in, in Wales today. And um, all the values that Julian had, called cooperation rather than the market, uh, working very closely with the needs of local people, um, GPs and practices actually being part of the research process rather than just simple service deliverers. All of these things are still live and still uh, to some extent or another being pursued 
um, because, because they're such important concepts. So we're very, very grateful uh, to particularly Jonathan for, for your, um, your contribution. And thank you, Gareth, as well. Uh, particularly, I think, for the film, uh, which was I'd not, not seen before and was really uh, very, very interesting. Um, I noticed that uh, it had a little clip of um, Julian as a young man speaking and his haircut, I noticed, was absolutely 2022. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, but it was really good to see that, that film. And uh, so thank you for bringing it to our attention. So um, I, in a minute, I'm going to ask people to unmute and to uh, thank you uh, directly. Just before that, uh, just to remind you that we've still got two uh, sessions in this four part series. And the next one is in a week's time, um, uh, Thursday week, which will be given by um, the man who was actually seen in the film today, Professor Graham Watt uh, from Glasgow. And he's going to be talking about Julian as a, as a GP, uh, and I, I suspect as well about um, his work in Glasgow, uh, which Jonathan um, touched on. Uh, so that's next Thursday, again at uh, one o'clock. And then uh, the following uh, Thursday, uh, that's uh, the 10th of uh, March, Professor George Davis Smith will be talking about something else which was mentioned uh, today, the inverse care law, uh, so that's again 10th of March at uh, one o'clock. Uh, so please do join us for those. Um, I hope we've succeeded in recording this session successfully and if so I'll put the recording on uh, the RISW YouTube channel which you'll be able to find very easily just by googling uh, YouTube and uh, Royal Institution of South Wales along with quite a number now of uh, other sessions which we've uh, recorded recently. So I think uh, that's all for now. And I'm just going to ask you now if you could just unmute uh, for a, a second or two and um, please clap or, or in, other, in other ways, uh, uh, thank Gareth and Jonathan for a wonderful hour. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, all of you for coming and we'll see you perhaps on another occasion. Hi everyone. Yeah, we're out. We're out. We're out. She got background. See. She's mad.